Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, thank you for joining us today. This is a candidate talk by Nandita Dupka. Nandita is a student of uh, Nick McEwen's at Stanford University. She has been working on various kinds of congestion control protocols and will be telling, about, telling us about RCP and a new metric that we should use when we evaluate these protocols. Thank you, Nandita. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction. So, good morning, everyone. I'll be, so I've been working on a new congestion control protocol called Rate Control Protocol, or RCP, whose main goal is uh, short download times or to minimize flow completion times, and that's what I'll be talking about for the next 50 minutes or so. So our internet is a large distributed shared infrastructure, and if you look above all the plumbing, the protocols, the mechanisms, and algorithms, it essentially boils down to these six key components of packets and multiplexing, naming, addressing, and forwarding, routing, security, mechanisms, uh, network management, and finally congestion control. Today, my talk is going to be about one of these crucial building blocks of our infrastructure, congestion control. The, goal of, the role of congestion control is to share the network bandwidth somewhat efficiently and fairly. Today, transmission control protocol, or TCP, is the most widely used mechanism. It works on an end-to-end -end basis where every connection before starting st begins with the question, what is the appropriate sending rate along the current network path? It does not receive an explicit answer to this question today, but every connection determines its sending rate by probing the network path for bandwidth and modulating its congestion window based upon its perceived sense of packet loss or delay. Every connection begins with a pre-configured initial window size and thereafter probes the network for available bandwidth using the slow start procedure in which it doubles its window size in every congestion free round trip time. And upon experiencing packet losses, it goes into a more conservative congestion avoidance mode in which it additively increases its window size by one packet in every round trip time and multiplicatively keeps reducing it by half on every packet loss. So far, these mechanisms of TCP have worked well for us. However, as the network bandwidths increase or the bandwidth delay pipe increases um, or the bandwidth delay product or the pipe size increases, these mechanisms are increasingly showing their age. And as a result, an improved congestion control mechanism will have a tremendous practical impact on our infrastructure. So here's a quick recap of why TCP does not work well in high bandwidth delay product environments. It has been now shown mathematically and demonstrated experimentally that it has problems as the pipe size increases. Well, first, TCP's additive increase of one packet per round trip time means uh, it's very slow in acquiring any spare capacity. It's where it takes a long time to f for flows to ramp up to their uh, to large window sizes. For example, if a flow needs to sustain a window size of 80,000 packets, which it needs if it wants to obtain a rate of 7.2 gigabits per second with a round trip time of 100 milliseconds, it takes approximately 40,000 round trip times or 70 minutes to recover from a single packet drop. Clearly, this is unacceptable. Second, TCP flows need unrealistically and extremely low loss probabilities in order to have large equilibrium window sizes. This is once again a consequence of TCP's slow additive increase, a drastic multiplicative decrease, and the fact that it cannot distinguish between losses due to congestion and due to uncorrectable errors. So TCP flows, uh, as a result, find it hard to obtain a large equilibrium window size in a high throughput environment. Third, TCP gets confused by lossy links. It treats loss as a binary indicator of congestion, and as a result, treats lossy networks such as wireless links as congested networks and underutilizes them. Fourth, TCP flows, the long round trip time flows in TCP have a hard time obtaining their fair share of the bottleneck bandwidth. This is because uh, TCP shares bandwidth inversely proportional to the round trip times. As a result, once a flow is in the AIMD, the long RTT flow 
opens up its congestion window much more slowly as compared with the short RTT flow and quickly loses out to the short RTT flows. While these are due to TCP's AIMD uh, mechanisms, not only is its AIMD inefficient, its slow start is inefficient too. Today, even when a flow is capable of finishing within a few round trip times or within one round trip time, its slow start makes it last multiple RTTs just to find its fair share rate. Very often, a flow, as it is the case today, flows finish before they reach their fair share rate. And as you can imagine, as the pipe size increases or the bandwidth delay product increases, it's just likely that more and more flows are capable of finishing within fewer round trip times making this inefficiency worse over time. While these are uh, due to the manifestations of, in the steady state properties of TCP's mechanisms, it has poor transient behavior as well because it is slow in adapting to sudden network changes which can occur either when the network conditions itself are changing dynamically such as in wireless environments or when the network traffic itself is uh, fast changing or dynamic. And finally, TCP deliberately fills up any amount of buffering available, available to it at the bottleneck links. So large buffers means extra delays, large delays, adding to the flow completion times. Now, instead of taking the Band-Aid approach of uh, fixing each of these problems, which by the way has its own set of advantages, I'm instead going to take a look at a fresh look at what are the wish list properties we would like to achieve in congestion control and what kind of a solution will get us there eventually. Uh, okay, so here's an outline of the talk. So I'm going to tell you, I'll give you a wish list of properties we would ideally like to achieve, what current research in congestion control, which of those properties do they achieve. I will then go on to describe to you the the goals, the design, the properties, and the weaknesses of the rate control protocol, the solution that I'm proposing. So let's just go on to uh, with the wish list of properties. So I've divided the wish list into two broad categories. Uh, those properties related to the flow and network level properties, and those related to equally importantly related to implementation and deployment. So first, we would ideally like to emulate processor sharing at the bottleneck link in the sense that we would like to share the link bandwidth somewhat efficiently and fairly amongst the flows. Why processor sharing? Because it has some very desirable characteristics. Well first, the flow completion times or other performance metrics in processor sharing are invariant of the flow size distribution, so it doesn't matter what mix of flow sizes you have. And second, although its mean flow completion time is not quite the minimum achievable, it comes reasonably close to it for all practical purposes. In fact, flows routinely complete an order of magnitude or more faster than with today's TCP. And finally, even if there are only long lived flows, it will result in an efficient and fair sharing of the bottleneck bandwidth. Flows will get a high throughput and the link is 100% utilized. Second, we would like, yes. So I recall from some of my classes on, a, on or my one class, I should just say, on queuing theory, that uh, in cases like web servers, there was some work where processor sharing, yes. which is kind of the current default, was their experiments that basically did, um, if I took the small jobs and just prioritized them higher, yeah. I would do even better. Is that Actually, a, I'll just come to that point. Later? Yes. Okay, yeah. no problem. Uh, in, in a few slides. Yeah. Okay. So the second property is we would, like to, we would like the network to be stable under a broad range of network and traffic conditions in the sense that we don't want any undesirable oscillations in the queue sizes even when offered with a constant deterministic load. Third, we, ideally we would like to keep the buffer occupancies very small. After all, packets queued in the buffer means an extra latency slapped on to every packet going through the queue. If possible, we would like to achieve a loss-free network. At the same time, we don't want to compromise the efficiency of the high bandwidth links, such as the long haul fiber optic links. We would like to make an efficient use of them. We would like to achieve some kind of proportional bandwidth sharing amongst the flows, in the sense that if I would like a more important file transfer to receive 
10x the bandwidth as a background movie download that I'm doing, it would be nice if congestion control can achieve that. And we would like to achieve all of these under irrespective of the network conditions, including heterogeneous round trip times, bandwidth delay products, different kinds of topologies, as well as challenging conditions such as the high delay of high loss rate wireless links, as well as under any traffic conditions such as long flows, short flows, mix of flows, sudden flash crowd scenarios, and so on. And now the properties related to implementation and deployment, it would be nice if there's a very simple, simple way in which we can police flows such that a few high bandwidth hoggers are not unnecessarily taking up more than their fair share of the bottleneck link. If there's a congestion, it would be nice if congestion control can provide us with simple mechanisms to be able to do so. And finally, we would like to achieve all of these without any per flow state, per flow queue, or per packet computations, ideally even without involving the network infrastructure in congestion control. Now notice that there are some, some of these properties are, um, are, are not always achievable together in the sense, suppose for example, if you want to achieve fast flow completion times as well as a loss-free network, on one hand, for fast flow completion times, you want to push the data across to get it across to the network at the soonest possible. On the other hand, if you want to achieve a loss-free network, you need to be conservative in injecting packets into the network and thereby prolong the flow durations. Take another example. If you want to achieve short flow completion times without, under any network conditions without involving the network infrastructure in congestion control. Now, without involving the network infrastructure, I'm forced to send my data conservatively and thereby prolong the flow duration because I don't know if my bottleneck rate is 10 kilobits per second or 10 gigabits per second. Now, let me just go on to tell you which of these properties do the current flavors of TCPs that we've, yes? So you also have a set of implicit assumptions here about what you can and cannot do in terms of uh, uh, changing the end hosts and the routers, right? For example, um, is admission control a permissible thing to do or no? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, I mean. Uh, so I mean, so I haven't different. really. These are just the wish list of properties we would like to achieve. I haven't really uh, 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 zeroed out any mechanisms by which you can achieve those. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it seems like some of these goals are similar to those that motivated stuff like core stateless fair queuing and algorithms like choke. Are you going to? Uh... Well, algorithms like choke or CSFQ. Well, firstly, they are router based router only schemes where they assume that the end hosts are doing whatever they would like to and right. yes that's right so i think they do achieve a subset of these wish list properties that yeah but you're not going to require the routers to help you at all scheme. well that's just in the wish list property that we have but the solution that i'm proposing of course does not achieve all of these properties and yes yeah so I'm by no means claiming that my solution achieves all of these. I'm going to show you which of them they achieve and which they don't, yeah. So it's just for deployment purposes, I put it down that it's good if you don't involve the infra infrastructure. So, um, so let me tell you the properties which the high-speed TCPs achieve, and by that I include all the recent flavors of TCPs we've seen, including compound TCP from Microsoft, fast TCP, big TCP, or um, Hamilton TCP, scalable TCP, and so on. The problem that these TCPs are essentially trying to solve is how can a few high bandwidth transfers share a long fat pipe efficiently and fairly? A niche problem that often arises in scientific computing, for example, the high energy and particle physics community routinely need to transfer a few terabyte worth of files from Slack at Stanford to CERN in Geneva. So their goals are essentially to maximize the network throughput while attaining some sense of fairness amongst the flows. They are primarily looking at to, uh, to share the network bandwidth efficiently and somewhat fairly amongst these high bandwidth flows, and they do a very good job about it. So long as all the flows are long-lived 
and the network and traffic conditions are not too challenging, such as a heterogeneous mix of round trip times or a dynamic mix of flow arrivals with a different uh, dynamic mix of flow sizes. But the biggest plus point, and naturally the properties in green are the ones that they achieve, while those in red are the properties they do not achieve. The biggest plus point of these TCPs is that they need absolutely no support or very little support from the network infrastructure. And most of the times, they only need changes to the, uh, to the TCP sender, so it's easy to deploy these mechanisms. But along with that comes the downside that in the absence of explicit information from the network, they're forced to resort to heuristics which are based on either packet loss or on packet delay and they generally find it hard to work well under traffic conditions that deviate from a set of long-lived flows or if you want to do well in metrics such as flow completion times. Probably tangential to your talk, but I think you're being a little bit unfair when you say that they don't, uh, high speed PCPs don't work under quote unquote any network conditions and any traffic mix. I mean, if you look at the literature on BIC and CTCP, people have gone to great lengths to evaluate their protocol under a very wide range of network conditions and a wide variety of traffic mix. And agree, they don't achieve whatever, you know, 100% link utilization, for example, under all the scenarios but they don't hurt other flows. I mean, people go out of their way to make sure that that happens. So, so I'm not as much saying that people haven't evaluated these under a broad range of network conditions. All I'm trying to say is that there isn't one proposal out there which can work well under, a, under any network or traffic conditions, yes. You know, um, uh, with certain amount of tweaking and hacking, yes, they can work well under a particular defined set of network and traffic conditions. But the goals that I've set out here are just much broader. So while there have been many efforts in the literature to, um, to alleviate TCP's problems in high bandwidth delay environments, but one of the boldest attempts so far has been the proposal of the Explicit Control Protocol, or XCP, which was proposed by Katabi and others as part of the new ARC project. XCP works by involving the routers in congestion control and it, the network explicitly tells the receiver the state of congestion in the network and this allows the senders to adjust their window sizes based upon this precise feedback information. So at any point, the, X, the new flows in XEP, they start with a small window size and thereafter they receive a small window increment or a decrement over the current window size of the flows. So the picture that you should have of XEP is at any point the XCP routers give a small window increment or a decrement over the current window sizes of the flows. And um, so different flows could have different window sizes and different round trip times and therefore different rates. And they're continuously trying to converge to the point where all the flows have the same fair share rate by slowly reducing the window sizes of flows with rates above the fair share and increasing the window sizes of flows with rates below the fair share. And this convergence Ultimately, it will converge to the fair share rate, and this convergence could take many round trip times, especially if there's little or no spare capacity in the network. Now, XAP is essentially trying to solve the same problems as, as the other high speed TCPs, which is how do a few high bandwidth transfers share a long fat pipe efficiently and fairly? And in fact, when all the flows are long lived, it results in flows getting a high throughput and fair sharing of the bottleneck bandwidth. But the biggest plus of XCP is that it achieves all of these, prop these properties that high-speed TCPs achieve while keeping the, the buffer occupancy very small. In fact, it can achieve almost close to a loss-free network. But that said, it doesn't make sense for the general internet because in the presence, when it solves the problems with TCP in the presence of a few long-lived flows when they literally have an infinite amount of data to send, in which case it shares the bottleneck bandwidth fairly and efficiently, it emulates processor sharing. But in reality, flows arrive randomly, they have a random dynamic mix of flow sizes, and in such an environment, it deviates far from processor sharing and does many times worse than even TCP. It's unfair and inefficient. In fact, when there are a mix of flow sizes, it makes the flow completion times routinely two orders of magnitude higher than necessary. 
And finally, it requires a lot of detailed per packet computations at the routers. To give you an example, so here's an example comparing the two protocols with uh, the ideal processor sharing that we can achieve. But before I get on to the example, let me just tell you a little bit about the metric that I'm using. If you look at the literature in congestion control, the metrics that you will most commonly find being used are either link utilization or convergence to fairness. Now, the two problems with metrics such as this, either it's a very network-centric metric such as link utilization, which doesn't mean which means a lot to a network operator, but not much to an end network user. In fact, it's not always in the interest of a network user to maximize the link utilization. Or it's a long-term property such as convergence to fairness, which once again doesn't mean much if the flow actually does not last long enough in order to experience these steady state values. Yes? I don't understand what you mean by convergence to fairness being a long-term property. It sounds like It sounds like it's exactly achieves processor sharing. What, what is convergence to fairness except it converges to processor sharing? Well, by, by convergence to fairness, well, I guess what I mean is it, uh, they test it under a very, it makes a lot of sense to processor sharing under a particular set of scenario if you have a set of long-lived flows. But otherwise, when you have a dynamic traffic mix where the input itself is changing quite rapidly, then um, what does convergence really mean in that, in a sense where the input itself is changing? So are you saying that the convergence to fairness will typically be slow? It kind of across the board it's slow? Well, all I'm saying is that it is not a metric which means much directly to the user. And, and I'm just using a more direct metric of how quickly a flow finishes. Yeah. What you're saying is that it doesn't mean anything to a job in a process or a queue either. I mean, it's the short ones go through, the way they go through, the long ones go through, the way they go through, but they're not aware of uh, the queue. They just benefit from the process sharing. But, so are you saying that the network doesn't look like a global process sharing queue? It, it, it never gets there. Is that what you're saying? That, that part, I mean, we know that the jobs don't really benefit, but are you saying that the network itself doesn't function as a process sharing queue or a maximum queue? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me just go through this uh, slide and maybe it is going to become clear. Okay. Um, I don't know what you mean by minimizing the flow duration. Um, from a system viewpoint, are you trying to minimize the average flow duration? Yes. Or are you trying to minimize the maximum flow duration? The, uh, the mean flow completion time for now, yeah. Mean flow completion time across all flows, or are you going to weigh that by the number of bytes of flow carries or no? Well, it's just, I'm just considering the mean flow completion time without weighing it, but you can, you can, if you want, you can consider variance of it, yeah. I don't think you want to weight it by bytes. Weighting it by bytes would weight the long flows higher. Right, you want to prioritize Yeah, short actually, flows it more. doesn't matter much. Uh, the reason why I don't want to prioritize short flows, I'm going to come to it quickly. So l let me just go through this uh, slide. So the metric that I'm considering here is how quickly uh, do the flows finish or flow completion times, because at the end of the day, that's what the users care about, and that's what the distributed applications care about. So. Here is an example in which um, the setup is a high bandwidth delay link. Link is 2.4 gigabits per second. The round trip time is 100 milliseconds. Flows come in as a Poisson process, and the flow size distribution is taken. The flow sizes are drawn from a distribution of heavy tails. So there are lots of short flows and a few long lived transfers. What you're seeing on the left hand side is the flow completion time in the units of seconds versus a subset of the flow sizes observed in the simulation. What, um, what you're seeing are three distinct lines. Most of the flows in TCP finish up in the slow start. A few of them experience losses, and they take longer to complete. This is the flow completion time, uh, flow completion times in XCP. And this is what the flows would have achieved if they were ideally processed or shared at the bottleneck link. On the right-hand side is the plot of the number of active flows in the simulation run. It's because TCP and XCP make the flows last longer than uh, in processor sharing, they correspondingly have more flows in progress at any instant. 
What I'm going to show you in the rest of the talk is how to achieve flow completion times close to this line of processor sharing while doing very little work at the routers. Okay, so did you have a question? Yeah. This, this work that they do at the routers for XCP, what is it? What, what, what is this heavy work that XCP is making the routers do? So, so XCP is constantly trying to figure out what should be the window increment or the decrement that I should be giving in this for this particular packet. Like a few multiplies per packet or something? Um, shift, maybe? No, actually, they have a few multiplications and a couple of divisions. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, that's not a lot of work. <laughs> when you have to look up the packet's IP address and stuff like that anyway. Yes. Oh, so I get different answers by talking to different people. So when I talk to people in Cisco, they are like, you know, this is a lot of work. It has to go into the ASIC, so you better be sure that this is the congestion control mechanism that you actually want to implement. So I, I think given a choice between two mechanisms that would perform almost identical or about the same, they would almost always go towards the one which has a lesser implementation. Yeah. So I think comparing XCP here is a little bit unfair because XCP is mostly sort of, um, um, like long-eye flows. Here you are... Here. That's exactly what I'm saying. So it is, so I'm not denying that. It is very good for long-left flows. In fact, it does much better than the high-speed TCPs and achieves all the goals that we had set out. All I'm saying is that under dynamic traffic conditions and under the metric of flow completion time, it isn't as good. So does it really make sense for the internet? Why don't you consider some other more complex schemes here? For example, maintain two different queues, one for mice and one for elephant. Uh, frankly, I don't think that is going to make much of a difference because uh, the mice are today are dominated by the number of round trip times that they are made to last and not so much on how much time they are spending at the routers. So having two separate queues is just going to reduce one part of the flow completion time, which is the queuing delay. But it's, it's still order of log n round trip times. OK. So before I go on, uh, with the, before I go on to tell you what, which of the wish list properties RCP achieves, let's just dwell on the metric of flow completion time coming to the question that you were asking. So, if you look at, now at the end of the day, as I said, this is what users care about. This is what distributed applications care about uh, when they involve the network in any interaction. Yet it's surprising that in spite of the thousands of papers in congestion control, there isn't one which looks at the fundamental question of how would we design a congestion control mechanism if we want to minimize flow completion times. Well, the problem is, if you look at it from the theoretical point of view, it's actually a hard question. Well, we know for a single bottleneck link, the shortest remaining processing time minimizes the flow completion times. But it's a preemptive discipline that needs flow size information ahead of time, which is often unavailable even to the end systems themselves. So this is um, impractical to implement it in the internet. And on the other hand, for a general network, where you have run in the presence of random flow arrivals and departures, we don't even know what an optimal solution would look like. But I think that it is better to come up with practical solutions, even if they are heuristic, in order to achieve short flow completion times. And one of the practical ways of doing it is to emulate an easier discipline of processor sharing, which does not quite minimize the flow completion time, but comes close to it for a lot of practical purposes. So does that answer your question that you had about? Uh... I will think about it. Sorry? I'll yeah. think about it. OK. Yeah. Like, could you talk about, shouldn't like queuing theory relate the number of jobs in the system to the utilization? I mean, to the, the, uh, if, I'm, if I'm making the flow completion time smaller, yes. I so you're correct. reduce utilization. So you're correct that um, in order to have short flow completion times, you need to have high utilization. But just guaranteeing that you have high utilization doesn't necessarily mean you will have short flow completion times. Yeah. So here are the wish list of properties that RCP sets out to achieve. The biggest plus point of RCP is short flow completion times under a broad range of network and traffic conditions. In fact, quite close to what the flows would have gotten under processor sharing. 
Along the way, it also achieves the other goals that high-speed TCPs and XCP set out to achieve, which is how do a, a, a few high bandwidth transfers share a long fat pipe efficiently and fairly. The biggest downsides of RCP are that A, it involves the routers in congestion control, so it needs help from the network infrastructure. Although simple, it does not completely do away with per packet computations. And second, there are no guarantees in RCP of achieving a loss-free network. In fact, when there are sudden changes in the network or when the traffic increases suddenly by some X times or there are flash crowd scenarios, there will be transient spikes in the queue and or packet losses. So, the approach in RCP is slightly different from that of TCP in, or XCP. Instead of incremental window changes in every round trip time, the question I'm asking is, is there an explicit rate the router can ask the flows to transmit at so as to emulate processor sharing, and what should this rate be? And I want to find this out in a very simple way. Now, if the router knew exactly the number of ongoing flows at every time instant t, and all the flows had, and there was no feedback delay between the congested point and uh, the sources, and all the flows are bottlenecked at exactly the same point in the network, and they all had same amount of traffic to send, then this question really is very simple. Just give the rate r is equal to the link capacity divided by the number of flows. Ask each flow to transmit at this rate, and we're done. But the problem is, it's hard to keep track of the exact number of flows n of t. And even if you do, there is a feedback delay. So by the time this information reaches back to the senders, n of t would have changed. And further, not all of these flows are bottlenecked at exactly the same point in the network. So, it, so n of t does not even really mean much uh, at a particular link. Which is why RCP is an adaptive algorithm that uh, updates the rate that it offers to the flows to approximate processor sharing in the presence of a feedback delay without any knowledge of the exact number of flows. It has these three characteristics which make it very simple and practical. The rate R that RCP picks is just based upon the queue size information, the aggregate incoming traffic, and the traffic actually there's one more term, the traffic averaged round trip time of the packets passing through the link. It offers a single rate to all the flows and it maintains, it does not have any per flow state or per flow queuing, although it does have very simple per packet computations. So this approach, uh, you, you would have seen this approach uh, uh, before, this is just the way in which uh, the network rate is communicated back to the end host, where every router maintains a single rate R of T, which it updates periodically, say once every average round trip time of the flows. Every flow before starting sends a SYN packet in which it, um, it puts in the desired rate it would like to transmit at, and it could be arbitrarily high. For practical uh, purposes, it makes sense that it puts in the local interface rate of the outgoing port. And, um, and as this packet goes through the network, if the rate at the router is lower than the rate in the carried in the packet, the router overwrites it. So by the time it reaches the receiver, it has the lowest rate corresponding to the most congested link along the path. And this information is sent back to the sender. The sender st uh, sets this as the starting rate and transmits its data at that rate. And thereafter, every packet carries, uh, this rate is piggybacked on every data and the reverse acknowledgement packet. And it could change depending upon the bottleneck, uh, as the bottleneck links change uh, during the lifetime of a flow. Apart from this, every sender also estimates its average round trip time and stamps it in every packet. The routers use this to maintain their moving average estimate of the traffic passing through the link. So let's see how the router, uh, how the RCP router updates the algorithm. Yes. I have a question which is very, which is I think a little bit more generic than the, than the, the thing that you just explained, which is just, aren't there real scenarios where there's nobody to do the computation at the point at which there's congestion? Like, isn't, isn't that what a, a, a wireless link that was shared by multiple sending and receiving pairs, wouldn't that correspond to 
there's nobody to tell me what the maximum rate is. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, I mean, this makes sense in a scenario where, of course, I, the questions like this come up all the time, where even if there are few entities uh, which can compute the rate, then uh, what about incremental deployability questions where not all, not all of them answer? So I have answers to those questions. Um, yeah, some of which I'll cover in the talk, and some of which I'm happy to take questions later about. Yeah. Okay. How often do you expect the acts to go back? Like once every packet, once every round trip time, or? At least once every round trip time. Yeah. But more often, depending on how often the acts are generated, but at least once a round trip time. Yeah. And then, uh, how, on what time scale is the application required to test the sending rate? So that, uh, so that depends. I think that you can vary the granularity, and we, I've tested it across all granularities. So at the smallest granularity is you paste the packets exactly according to the rate that you are receiving. At, at the other end of the spectrum would be you just convert this to a window size and transmit a window's worth of packets within the round trip time. So, uh, or you can achieve anywhere in between. So right now, uh, the way the current implementation works is it just chooses a granularity that the end host can transmit at and paces the packets at that end. Yeah. Okay, so the router updates the rate R w once every round trip time and um, in order to emulate processor sharing. And so for, it can update it more often, but let's assume that it does it once every average round trip time for now. In order to approximate processor sharing, intuitively, the router needs to do three things. It needs to offer the same rate to every flow. It needs to fill up the outgoing link with traffic. And it needs to keep the buffer occupancies or the queue occupancies small. And this is exactly the intuition on which this rate update equation is based upon. So let me explain the notation out here. So R of t is the rate maintained by the router at time t. R of t minus d0 is the traffic averaged round trip time the router maintains. R of t minus d0 is the rate the router updated at the beginning of the previous control interval. C is the link capacity. Y of t is the aggregate incoming traffic rate. Q of t is the instantaneous Q occupancy. Alpha and beta are parameters which are chosen for stability and for performance. N hat of t is the router's estimate of the number of flows. So what this equation is essentially trying to do is, if there is spare capacity available, that is c minus y of t is greater than 0, then you want to divide it equally amongst all the flows. On the other hand, if the link is oversubscribed, which can happen when c minus y of t is less than 0, or if there is a queue building up, then you want to penalize all the flows evenly in order to drain, in order to reduce the oversubscription. The bandwidth needed to drain the Q is Q of T divided by D0, and dividing that by the estimate of the number of flows gives the per flow re rate reduction uh, that is needed. So you can think of the numerator as the aggregate change in rate that you want to bring about in every control interval, and dividing that by the router's estimate of the number of flows gives the per flow change in rate that you want to bring about. Now, the router knows exactly um, the aggregate traffic, it knows the instantaneous Q occupancy, but it doesn't have the exact number of flow. It doesn't know the exact number of flows. The good part is it doesn't need to know the exact number of flows. It uses an estimate for the number of flows, which is the link capacity divided by the rate of the previous round trip time. We will shortly see why, when this is a good estimate and when it's okay not to have the exact estimate. A couple of minor additions to this basic equation. For example, suppose we would like to update the rate more often than a round trip time. For example, if there's a queue building up, why wait for an entire round trip time in order to drain the queue? At least the newly starting flows can start receiving a smaller rate. So we update the rate more often, say once every t seconds, where t is typically smaller than a round trip time. And in order to maintain a stable system, you scale the change that you bring about each time appropriately by t divided by d0. Similarly, gamma here controls the peak link utilization. If we want to operate the link at, say, 95% peak utilization as opposed to 100%, in order to give some headroom for sudden surges in traffic to drain away before a queue starts to build up, 
then gamma is can be set to 0.95 as opposed to 1. Yes? Is estimating the number of flows um, by something like counting hard? Um, it isn't hard. There are techniques now, I mean techniques using bloom filters that can keep a fairly accurate estimate of the number of flows. But let me tell you why we don't need to keep track of it. Actually, in some situations, it turns out to be good that you don't have the exact estimate of the number of flows. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the slide. So, so as pointed out, you know, it's, uh, the router know, when the router updates the rate, it knows exactly the link capacity, it knows the aggregate amount of incoming traffic, it knows the, the queue occupancy and the average RTT. So in some sense, the success of this algorithm is going to depend on how good the estimate C over R is for the number of flows. Now it turns out that when, the flows, when all the flows are long-lived, C over R will converge to the correct estimate of the number of flows. For example, here the 20 long flows started at time 0, 20 more flows started at time 40, 20 flows finished at time 100, and in each case C R over C converged to the correct value of 1 over N, or C over R converged to N. Now, even when flows are not long-lived, but they are um, arriving rapidly and departing, and departing quickly, but the mean flow size is comparable to the bandwidth delay product. Even in that case, C over R is a good estimate of the number of flows. It's just a noisy estimate because the flows are arriving and departing. What happens when the mean flow size is much smaller than the bandwidth delay product? Well, in this case, you have lots of short flows, a few long flows, and basically a traffic mix. In that case, C over R actually underestimates the number of flows. But underestimating the number of flows and thereby giving a higher rate to every flow is actually the right thing to do. Because if most flows do not have traffic for an entire round trip time worth of data to send, then giving exactly C over N to every flow means the pipe is never going to be filled. So you can think of R in this case to represent the maximum fair share rate. And R correctly, uh, C over R correctly so has no connotation to the exact number of flows. Take for example out here where the bandwidth delay product is 1,000 packets. So you have four, lots of short flows. There are four short flows of 125 packets each. So they're capable of finishing within a round trip time. And there is one very long flow. Now, the correct thing to do out here would be to let the short flows take away whatever bandwidth they need and then share the remaining bandwidth amongst the bottleneck flows or the long flows. And that gives uh, C over R here to be, or R over C to be 0.5, which is the correct fair share rate of the bottleneck flows. If you feed this traffic into RCP, that is what the RCP rate would converge to. Yes? So how do we understand convergence rate? Huh. Is the convergence rate just one round trip? No, convergence rate is in the, is in the order of five to 10 round trip times. So that will, de actually I was going to come to that, but uh, the convergence rate will depend a lot on the parameters of RCP. If you, in the best case, they're in the order of five, between five and 10 round trip times, independent of the link capacity, the, round, the exact value of the round trip time, or the number of flows. Okay. Yeah. So in your previous slides, I don't see where you take into the consideration of like some flows are not bottleneck at the link. Mm -hmm. You just divide by all the, the number of flow. And so if some flows are not bottleneck, then essentially the route uh, the router is going to see spare capacity is going to see that there is spare capacity available and it will increase the rate. So that is why I said that we don't need an exact estimate of the number of flows precisely for reasons like not all flows are bottlenecked uh, at the same link. Does that make sense? So if, if not all flows are bottlenecked, you will achieve the maximum fair share rate. So C over R will be whatever is that number depending on the maximum fair share rate. It is not the exact number of flows. Yes? So now the calculation makes sense, but I don't understand why I should think about estimative number of flows at all. Yeah, so um, you need a somewhat an estimate, so this is an exact estimate of the number of flows. If 
um, all the flows are bottlenecked at this link and they all have the same amount of traffic to send. So I think it's just an intuitive way of thinking about it and that's why I say it. But, but really, you don't need an exact estimate of the number of flows. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, you have taken packet size anywhere into consideration here. You're assuming that all flows are yeah. the same packet size. Yeah. Well, so for example, well, the rate is but the rate that uh, the, so talking about the units, the rate that I'm talking about, say for now, is bytes and bytes per millisecond. So that's how I've implemented it as, and um, so no, the, the rate, the, the packets do come into picture, right? Because you are estimating round trip time based on the samples carried in the packet headers. So if there is a flow, if there are two flows. Okay, one of which is yeah. suddenly sending packets that are one third of the size because you know 538 bytes. Yeah, are absolutely. Deals. So uh, you're completely RTD correct. So the RTT estimation there. actually, uh, so I haven't talked about how the RTT estimation is done out here. The RTT is just a, um, it's a weighted moving average estimate. Right. So you do take care of the packet sizes into consideration when uh, estimating the RTT. It's weighted by the packet size. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, all it does is. Uh, weighted by the packet size times the RTT value, and it's just a running sum. Um, and at the end of the control interval, it divides by the total number of bytes that it has seen to give a average RTT. So there are pros and cons to that. So that would be the correct way of doing it. But on the other hand, that would involve a multiplication for every packet. Um, yeah. OK. So in order to make the RCP story complete, there are many problems that, uh, that I solved about RCP, which is first of all, um, it's short flow completion, showed it has short flow completion times under a broad range of network and traffic conditions. Um, how would, uh, showed that it is stable um, under a wide, or you can choose its parameters, alpha and beta, for the protocol to be stable irrespective of uh, the link capacity, the round trip time, and the number of flows. Similarly, under homogeneous and heterogeneous delays, how would you choose its parameters for good performance? Uh, how would you uh, achieve proportional bandwidth sharing of flows in RCP? Similarly, what would be the buffer sizing requirements be under RCP? Buffer sizing has received a lot of attention because of the implications, the cost, and uh, the power requirements that it imposes on routers. So computer the amount of buffering that RCP flows would need. And then uh, I've implemented RCP. The RCP end host is in the Linux kernel, whereas the, uh, the router algorithm is implemented in the net FPGA uh, hardware. And then solutions, uh, problems relating to incremental deployment, deployment of RCP. For example, if x percent of the flows at a queue are RCP and 100 minus x are non-RCP flows, what would be the bandwidth sharing like? Similarly, if y percent of the routers in the network understand RCP and the rest of them don't understand RCP, uh, what would the bandwidth sharing be like? And finally, the, Ach the Achilles heel of RCP, which is uh, how does RCP cope with its weakness, which is essentially sudden changes in the traffic patterns. And finally, a variant of RCP, which I called RCP-AC, or RCP with acceleration control. So in the rest of the talk, uh, rest of the time that I have here, I'm just going to touch upon the, uh, those is questions highlighted in blue. And I'll be happy to take any questions on the rest of the topics. OK, so I've tested RCP performance uh, uh, exhaustively through simulations and currently through experiments under a wide range of different traffic characteristics, such as under different mean flow sizes, under different flow size distributions, under different flow arrival patterns, under different offered loads, and similarly under different network conditions, such as um, as the bandwidth delay products increase or the RTTs, link capacities increase, different topologies, reverse congested links, and so on. And in each case, the metric of interest was the average flow completion time, where flow completion time is defined as the time interval between when the sender sends a SYN packet to when the receiver receives the last packet of the flow. And in each case, this metric was compared to the flow completion times in TCP and XCP, as well as that with the ideal processor sharing. The, uh, 
the values for ideal processor sharing were taken from this analytical expression where L is the flow length, C is the link capacity, rho is the offered load. So it's at least, um, and it's lower bounded by this expression out here, so it is one round trip time for the sin sin ACK setup plus the duration of the data transfer. So let me just give you a sample of these uh, simulation runs. So this shows uh, an example when the mean flow size is small compared to the bandwidth delay product. The setup is similar to what we've seen before where the link is 2.4 gigabits per second, a round trip time of 80 milliseconds. Flows come in randomly and flow sizes are drawn from a heavy tail distribution. The top two plots show the flow, average flow completion time versus a subset of the flow sizes observed in the simulation. The, um, the y-axis is in the units of seconds. These are for the short, the left-hand plot is for the smaller flow sizes. The right-hand plot is for the larger flow sizes. What you're seeing out here are four distinct lines. The blue line is the flow completion times under RCP. It follows closely that of the red dotted line, which is the flow completion time under processor sharing. The green line is the, are the flow completion times in TCP. Most of them finish up in slow start. A few of them experience packet losses, and they take much longer to finish. In this case, TCP's delay is about five times higher than that of RCP. And this is the flow completion time under XCP, where it takes, uh, in this case, it takes about 30 times longer. So uh, while this shows the average flow completion time, what this shows is the maximum flow completion time observed for any particular flow size. In case of RCP, the maximum is quite close to the mean because the variance is actually quite small. And uh, the maximum is also close to that of processor sharing. Whereas in TCP, flows routinely, they, the maximum is routinely 10 times above the mean. XCP also has a small variance. Notice that in the presence of, although XCP is primarily designed to work well for long-lived flows, but when there are a dynamic, a mix of flows, it performs badly for all of them, for short as well as the long-lived flows. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that XCP is actually always worse than TCP because that isn't quite true. In fact, when when you increase the mean flow size uh, to approach the bandwidth delay product, you're approaching the regime where you have a few um, high bandwidth flows multiplexed on a large link. This is precisely the regime where TCP SAC has uh, most of the problems as addressed by the high-speed TCPs, and XCP begins to perform better as shown in this example. So here, the bandwidth delay product, the mean flow size is much larger compared to the bandwidth delay product. And XCP approaches close to that of processor sharing, whereas TCP gets, uh, begins to behave badly. RCP is close to processor sharing in material of the flow size, the exact flow size. Now, let's just look at a sample. Uh, if you draw a, sam a, sam a random flow and observe from the simulation, what is it about these mechanisms that is giving such vastly different flow completion times, then it's very likely that you will observe one of this. What this picture shows is the sequence number evolution as seen by the receiver uh, at the receiving end of the flow. For example, let's focus on TCP. Most of the flows in TCP, they finish up in the slow start mode. They finish before they exit slow start. So in the very best case, when they experience no congestion at all, it takes in the order of log in round trip times to finish. In RCP, the same flows get a jump start closer to what, based what they would have gotten if they were being ideally processed or shared. So flows finish quickly. Yes? Is uh, RCP a rate-based solution or a window-based solution? I don't think it matters as much whether it is rate-based or window-based. The way it is implemented right now is a rate-based solution. What matters is, um, in this case, is what is the rate that you started out with? Yeah, yeah but if you are rate-based, you can you continue to send out packet even without receiving any feedback yet, right? So you take some advantage. To no, no, no. So it it also so even if it paces out packets, it all it does have a window size that it maintains. So if it doesn't receive enough acknowledgments um, to send out the next windows worth of packets, it won't. Okay. Yeah. So it is a mix of 
you can call it a hybrid of rate and window based so you have the ACK control still yeah so let's look at the flows uh, in TCP which have experienced at least one packet drop in their lifetime these flows would have exited into the AI MD mode and once in the AI MD mode they take much longer to finish because they're slow in acquiring any spare capacity uh, available in the network RCP flows on the other hand are quick to grab any spare capacity when available and back off at the onset of congestion so these flows finish quicker. XCP on the other hand is slow in giving bandwidth to the newly starting flows especially when there are a large number of flows. It gives a small window increment uh, to every newly starting flow or to all the flows and slowly reduces the window sizes of the existing flows making sure that there is no bandwidth oversubscription ever. So it takes many round trip times for most of the flows to reach their fair share rate, which by the way is changing continuously as new flows arrive and the old flows finish. In general, it, um, it, is, uh, it avoids oversubscribing the link and keep the buffer occupancy small at all the times and thereby prolongs the flow duration. Yeah. So you had a very strong categorical statement about XCP never oversubscribes the link, but it, it's, intuitively it's got to be the case that there's you know some number of simultaneous flow initiations where then XCP oversubscribes the link, and you also have some number of simultaneous flow you know creations, and they're just different numbers. What what is the quantitative? Is there do you know quantitative difference where like for XCP? Yes, XCP you're right. Really that um, right. so I'm so. That statement was made um, not in the strictest sense. You're right that if there are large number of flows coming in and each one, and it gives a minimum of one, it's, they all start with a minimum window size of one packet, the link will be oversubscribed. Um, but but in the very, within a one round trip time, it just makes sure that it reduces the rate from one packet per round trip time to say one packet for every 10 round trip times and reduces the oversubscription significantly. So it can, realize a network where there is literally no oversubscription and zero packet losses. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay, so uh, I can keep showing you hundreds of simulations and control theoretic proofs to show that RCP, um, RCP uh, achieves a stable network and short flow completion times, but let me just go through a couple of examples to see what would this really translate to an end network user. So here's an example that shows how uh, a user uh, <clears throat> experiences short flow completion times when using multiple back-to-back, -back, uh, downloading multiple back-to-back -back short flows. So here I am, a user, uh, looking to replace, say, the desktop, the, uh, the wallpaper of my desktop, and I go to, say, live search. And nice. <laughs> uh, and look at all the images showing sunsets and sunrises. So uh, I get a thumbnail of images, and then uh, suppose each of these images is about is one megabyte, and then I go and click on each of these images until a larger image comes down. Now here I'm a lucky user sitting behind a 100 Mbps link. Now in case of TCP, each of these small, or I keep clicking these images until I find the image that I like. Say I find the 10th image that I like, a sunset seen near the Golden Gate Bridge. Now in case of TCP, each of these images, in the very best case, in a congestion-free round trip time, congestion-free network is going to take at least 10 round trip times to finish. So consequently, it'll be at least eight seconds before I find the image that I like. In case of RCP, each of these images is capable of downloading within a single round trip time, and I find what I'm looking for in less than a couple of seconds. Another way to look at it is, in the time that it takes TCP to download 10 of these images, RCP can finish downloading 50 of them. Yes. So in TCP, there are also improvements that allows you to remember the previous window size, so you don't have to start from. Sure. Start yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm not saying that under, you know, that under no conditions you can emulate this behavior of TCP. So under certain conditions, it is possible to do so. But when there is no history, you have to rely back. The question I'm looking at is. Fundamentally, from the infrastructure point of view, if we want to achieve short flow completion times, how would we do it for a broad range of conditions? But under, 
you can, uh, for example, start with a larger initial window size and possibly achieve the same things with TCP, but that also leads to, that could lead to, say, higher losses in the slow start mode and other problems. So, yeah. also in, in your case, uh, uh, suppose there's only one congestion link, you can definitely find the optimal rate in one rock of time. But if there are multiple links and you are not at the bottleneck link, it may take multiple rock of time for you to find the rate. For example, suppose the initial router first assign you our optimal rate, but you are not bottleneck at that router, mm -hmm. and it takes multiple round trip time for that router to find your optimal rate, they are allowed to increase, and actually your bottleneck is, uh, is uh, a downstream router. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. But you know, that's, so I mean, you're right that it will take multiple, because this router is gonna see more spare capacity available, but the claim that I'm saying is no matter what spare capacity that if I have a certain amount of spare capacity in RCP, I can use this in order of one round trip times. Yeah, yeah. I find all your simulations are based on one, one link. Mm -hmm. So have you- No, actually, there, so there are simulations with uh, multiple bottleneck links too, yeah. Questions. So uh, nowadays there is uh, some work done by uh, improving TCP slow start by using available bandwidth estimation techni technology, excuse me. So you can, when you do slow start, you send out two packets, and ideally, by using four packets, you can figure out the available bandwidth, and you jump to that directly, and then they all can also shorten the downloading time of such small files, such, such as one megabyte in your simulation, in this case. So how you... So actually, there are proposals similar to that, for example, PCP from, uh, from University of Washington, from Tom, Tom Anderson's group in University of Washington. It does something similar to what you've just, just described. But um, they all depend on the, f they, they rely on the fact that you will be able to get an estimate, a good estimate of uh, the amount of available bandwidth using a small number of packets initially. So it relies on how good the heuristics are. And there are certain strong properties that you cannot achieve uh, with those. For example, if I'm a user and I just want to blast at one gigabit per second for a couple of round trip times and just stop, you will not be able to you, you will not be able to do that using just end host based schemes like that. So it is not my claim that there is no end host based scheme that cannot achieve um, th that cannot achieve uh, solutions close to this. It's just that it is hard for them to work well under to do this and work well under a broad set of conditions. They don't need to modify the router and it should be easy to deploy it. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, in all fairness, I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, she's proposing, she's studying, you know, she wants to change the router, and I think that's fair. Yeah, I try to understand what is the. I mean, so, uh, so, so the know. answer to your question is there are there are a subset <coughs> of things that you can achieve with only end host based things, but there are a subset of things that you cannot achieve. For example, as I just said, if I there are lost opportunities without involving if you don't involve the routers in congestion control. If I just want to blast the network for a couple of round trip times at a high uh, some gigabits per second and just stop, there is no way you can do that with only end host based schemes. Whereas today, I mean, if in case of RCP, if the network can allow such a high rate for short number of round trip times, I can do so. Yeah. Yes. What are the points in the network where the occasional overflow is going to occur? Why is that? It's mostly at the edge, at the edge routers, I would believe. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's going to make any difference to the core. Okay. Yeah. And why is that okay? I mean, does nothing bad happen? Does it interfere with their no IGP flows or nothing. Sorry, I don't think nothing I understood your question. You I, I asked one question, then I asked a follow-up question. Okay. So you answered the first question. So the first question, the que yeah, I, yeah, great. So the second question was, why is that okay? Why, why is it, so if RCP is going to increase the frequency with which buffers overflow, Oh, you said, so you're asking at what points in the network would RCP exhibit the weakness of overflowing oh, buffers? Right. Okay. And my second question was, why is that Then okay that is there? not the answer. The first question was not my answer. Sorry. So, okay. uh, so it can, I mean, RCP can exhibit, uh, the, the buffers can overflow whenever there are sudden changes in the network, right. which is essentially if the aggregate amount of traffic being offered suddenly increases by, I don't know, two times, ten times within a single round trip time. That's when the buffers overflow. And when do such 
so and when do such things happen they okay they happen mostly in the low multiplexed links such as the the access links the edge links where the low number of users multiplexed over yeah a link it's less likely to happen in a backbone network okay yeah. do those routers <clears throat> not experience anything bad? There's no BGP sessions if this crowds out? There's Is there any kind of anything no. that... BGP is also anything what has to be totally fine. I think it's a valid question. Can you give priority to some traffic? Or you yes, you can. Yeah. So there is a very so basically uh, by that I mean um, instead of wait, uh, achieving proportional processor sharing, you can have a generalized processor sharing where I can have one flow take 10x the link, where another flow take only uh, sorry, one flow take 90% uh, uh, of the link, and another flow just take 10% uh, of the link, and things like that. But this is different. Uh, you can have a flow take a large part of the link, but this doesn't mean that the flow gets a higher priority. For example, a BGP like between two routers, I don't want any loss between a BGP session. It may take a very small amount of the total bandwidth, mm -hmm. but uh, simply assign it a large bandwidth will lead to a poor utilization. I think so you're, you're talking about doing a priority on top of the resource allocation. Possibly you can do that. Frankly, I haven't tried it. Yeah, but I I don't see why it would be a problem in that case because you're just trying to make sure that it doesn't uh, this gets the prior it gets to the head of the queue as quickly as possible. So you can do that that is kind of orthogonal to the resource allocation problem that RCP is trying to solve. Hmm. Drop too, right? I mean, could, there's priority and then there's just don't drop my packets. And you could easily have a router, when it starts getting 3 quarters full or 90% full or whatever, start dropping the packets from flows that you don't care about versus the ones you do. So, uh, I mean, that's completely well, uh, That means you're doing something for flow. Yeah. Well, there's, I think, no. Well, it's not necessarily even per flow. You could just simply say, is this a BGP packet? Don't drop yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, certain kind of things. Or, but it, so this is this actually brings me, which is, brings me to the question I wanted to ask, which is, just look at this slide. You said TCP takes 8 seconds, RCP takes 1.6 seconds. There is something inherently unfair about that comparison. For RCP, you're modifying the router, right? For TCP, it's only completely edge end dose based protocol. So these numbers are fine. There is no doubt about that. But if you're going to compare against a baseline, that baseline better be the best thing you can achieve while modifying routers. The and best. that's not TCP. So why not why not compare it against, for example, fair queuing? Actually, with fair queuing, it would be 1.6. This 1.6 just comes from the dominant round trip time. All I'm trying to do is, um, I'm not trying to make look TCP bad. All I'm trying to tell is, this is the impact it can possibly have on end user experience if you get to modify the routers. That's all I'm trying to say. So the good thing the computer computer yeah. there is showing how close RCP gets to processor sharing. Right. Because you can't beat that. You look fine. Well, I think that that's where I come back to core statements, right? Mm -hmm. Core exactly. statements was trying to do your queuing without yeah. exactly. your flow state for not just for TCP, but whatever shows up. I'm sure you answer that. So how do you uh, yes, compare your work to the core statements? So, okay, so the, the two things that RCP is changing, right? I mean, core stateless fair queuing is essentially changing how the queuing mechanisms, how the queuing is done at the bottleneck link and how they share the bandwidth, no matter what the end host does. But I'm saying that the mechanisms by which TCP injects packets um, itself, uh, if you change that, then it can make a lot of difference. For example, if you have lots of short flows and they're taking code stateless fair queuing does not change the order of logged round trip times that TCP short flows are, will take. It can ensure a smaller queuing delay uh, to the short flows because it has. But it comes close to any change to TCP. That's what the converse. It doesn't matter. Uh, I find this very convincing for images, but a friend logged on to Gmail the other day, and a single log on to Gmail, just to look at it, consisted of 82 separate flows, of which almost all of them were just one packet long. I think the longest packet, uh, the longest flow was 16 packets. So all through your talk, I was wishing you'd zoom in on just the 0 to 10 size of your graph rather than 0 to 1,000. My impression also is that RCP will not be different 
from TCP for one packet flows, obviously, because it hasn't got. There's nothing much you can do but one packet. Yeah. So. I mean, there's what. There is possibly no congestion control or rate allocation or resource allocation you can do if it's just one or two packets. Yeah. So I think the other mechanisms that you know that people do at the application layers. I mean, like things like riverbed and web accelerators. They do caching and uh, um, just prefetching and things like that will have a bigger effect uh, if you're talking of very short flows in the order of one or two packets. It does. It means that what will actually be the dominant user experience for web browsing and web 2.0 and interactive stuff will be completely unrelated almost to rate control. If the flows are that short, yes, absolutely. But I think there are, you know, with video and uh, large images, there are a sufficient number of flows that can benefit from rate control. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a point that it could be the reason that when you log into Gmail today that it does do a large number of very short flows is because that's the way to get around TCP being slow if they put all that stuff in the same flow. It, it, it could actually be an application writer's decision to make as many flows as possible, so of, of as few packets as possible, to get around the latency issues. Uh, no, they're all done as, about 50 of them are done in series. Only about 30 are done in parallel. Well, it doesn't matter. If, if they're waiting for them to finish, um, instead of sending them all in a single flow, they, they, they get the same effect. There, nothing is slowing down the sending of those packets because it's doing them as individual flows. Yeah, it starts one flow, it waits till it finishes, it sends the next. Flow. Right, but if it's on all the packages and the packets, and it's, in fact, actually what you're doing is arguing my point, is that if they put them all in the same flow, they would actually get a slower send time. But Brian, that depends on where your bottleneck is. Your bottleneck is your first uploader. You're not going to do, you just going to do really bad things because you're going to get a timeout now. If you're in slow start, you lose a packet, you get a timeout. No, they're avoiding going into slow start. Right, right. If you just send two packet flows and you lose a packet because the first uploader is the bottleneck, you're going to get a timeout. Right. Yeah, so you're, it's not necessarily the most optimal thing to do. We can take this offline. It's right. separate. Right. Okay, so um, since I have 10 more minutes, I'm just going to quickly, we are almost at the end of the talk. This is another example which shows how a user um, is, how a user um, is going to, how, with RCP, a user can take up sudden changes in the bandwidth and use it. For example, so here I am, a user, again, sitting behind a 100 MVPS link, looking, watching videos through YouTube or, say, MSN video. And um, so uh, I'm sharing this link. And it's great video quality until one by one different users with different applications come up. So some users are checking email. Some users are watching um, t television through the internet or downloading the greatest, latest Windows Vista, and so on. And they're all sharing the link approximately in equal uh, bandwidths until now suppose, and, and as the different users are coming up, I see my video quality slowly degrading over time. Suppose the rest of the users are done downloading whatever they have to, and suddenly I have the link to myself. Now, I, I as a user would expect my video quality would just to improve in a blast because now I have this entire link to myself. But guess what? A TCP flow in AIMD is going to take at least uh, 1,200 round trip times or 120 seconds to fill up this pipe. Whereas with RCP, you can fill up this pipe in order of 10 round trip times, which is closer to a second. OK, so a question that comes up about RCP is, do these short flow completion times come at the cost of network instability in the sense that if there are sudden changes in the network, uh, it's a desirable property of any congestion control mechanism that it converges to the equilibrium behavior and remains at the equilibrium point. And even if perturbed, it should return to this equilibrium behavior. For example, um, in this case, when there are three sudden changes in the network for this particular set of RCP parameters, the system was stable and it remained there. On the other hand, for a different set of parameters, there are wild rate oscillations. The queue sizes oscillate. Router buffers overflow. Pa packet losses happen, and bad things happen. Fortunately, in the case of RCP, we can find using tools in control theory that we can choose its parameters alpha and beta such that the algorithm is stable independent of the link capacity, the round trip time, 
or the number of flows in the network. So these are the control the differential equations representing the RCP system, the rate update equation, the round trip time, the way the queue size evolves at the router, including the nonlinearity at the queue, and the aggregate incoming traffic rate. And using these tools, it's very, uh, we can, although those set of equations are for a single link with homogeneous delays, but using tools in control theory, it's possible to find the stable region of parameters alpha and beta, as shown in this diagram. So there are two plots shown out here. The one in the blue is the linearized stable region obtained of the system by ignoring the nonlinearity in the queue. And it says, I'm just coming, coming. And it says that so long as you choose the parameters alpha and beta in this stable region, the, the system is stable independent of the link capacity or the network conditions. But actually, simulations of the nonlinear system taking care specifically of the nonlinearity in the queue size shows that the system is stable for a larger set of parameters alpha and beta, which encapsulates this linearized region and it's to the left of this red dotted line. So the nonlinearity is actually helping the system become more stable in this case. And uh, collaborations with a few control theorists at Stanford, they were actually able to characterize this nonlinear region analytically. So this is an important characteristic of congestion control mechanisms. We know the number of papers that have been written trying to tune the parameters of red. The good, the good part about this is once we set the parameters of RCP, we don't have to change it. Yes? Is still for one link analysis? Yeah, so that is for a single link. So it actually turned out, yeah. Second is that you allow different router to take different alpha beta? Yes, yeah. Okay, but the analysis is still one link though. Yes, so uh, actually I was just coming to this point that it was hard to get a close from theoretically stable uh, result for a general scenario of multiple bottleneck links with arbitrary, uh, with arbitrary round trip times. But actually, simulations are very specific, deliberately chosen examples, which intuitively will be the worst case scenarios for RCP stability. Uh, for example, in this scenario where you have flows with four orders of magnitude difference uh, in their round trip times, sharing multiple bottleneck links, show that the same stable region that, was, that we derived for the single link also holds true for the multiple link case. Uh, yeah. Just one quick question to make sure I understand. In the wish list, you say RCP work for arbitrary, say any network condition or topology. Is it, is it what you claim? Uh, in the wish, yeah. wish list, you say RCP works for under any network condition, mm -hmm. including arbitrary topology, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, do you have simulation or analysis showing? Yeah, I mean, the analysis is the stability analysis, but I do have simulation showing under different topologies and different network conditions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go. I'm almost at the, the, the end, end of the point. talk. Okay. Yeah. So let me come to the Achilles heel of RCP. So the biggest weakness of RCP is, of course, the danger of overflowing the buffers, especially when there are sudden rapid changes in the network. For example, the network traffic increases by some x times within a round trip time. Now, in backbone networks where the traffic is so smooth, such sudden changes are unlikely to happen, but it can and it will occasionally happen in the access networks, uh, where, which, uh, which are uh, typically more bursty and low multiplexed environments. For example, in this setup, there were 50 flows sharing the link at starting from time zero, um, and 50 more flows start suddenly starting at time 40 within a single round trip time, so the load doubled. The top plot shows the link utilization, the, the middle plot shows the queue occupancy, and the bottom plot shows the RCP rate evolution. And when such sudden changes happen, there's a spike in the queue size, and RCP reduces its rate aggressively in response to this spike in the queue size and tries to converge, find out what its new fair share rate is. And it does so, uh, and it finds so, provably so, from the stability analysis. So RCP is not optimized to prevent bad things from happening in the network. It's optimized to recover quickly if and when such bad things happen in the network. And we know from the stability analysis that it will provably recover 
and as to the amount of time that it will take, that depends on how you set the parameters alpha and beta. In the very best case, it's in the order of 5 to 10 round trip times. But if you choose the parameters extremely conservatively, it can even take up to 50 round trip times. So that weakness of RCP got me interested in exploring the design space of congestion control algorithms. And that's when I came about RC with RCPAC, which stands for RCP with acceleration control, which is um, an enhanced version of RCP that can be made to work well under a broader set of traffic conditions. So in RCPAC, in addition to rate control, there is an additional control which I call acceleration control, which determines how quickly the flows jump to the rate set by RCP. So you can achieve a spectrum of congestion control algorithms where at one end, when the acceleration is large, you achieve the behavior as vanilla RCP, where you jump start to the starting rate, your flow completion times are small, but under sudden network changes, buffers can overflow. And at the other end of the spectrum, when the acceleration is small, you, achieve, you can achieve a more conservative uh, congestion control algorithm where you can control the worst case queue occupancies and uh, the worst case packet losses. And this can be made adaptive. So in environments where the traffic changes are sudden and unpredictable, it, you want to choose a small acceleration. Whereas in environments where the traffic is more well behaved and smooth, you want to do with a larger acceleration. So that actually gets to the end of my talk, uh, almost the end. So the, the topics that I haven't had a chance to touch about, uh, how to achieve proportional bandwidth sharing, buffer sizing, RCP implementation, real systems, and incremental deployment are uh, topics I'd be happy to take questions on. So to conclude, uh, TCP begins to behave badly in a high bandwidth delay environment. There are tweaks and hacks and incremental solutions to TCP, but so long as you rely on either packet loss or packet delay as your only indication of congestion, there is only so much you can do. It is hard to make it work well under a broad set of traffic and network conditions. XCP is a bold attempt, but it hasn't achieved what it set out to do. Just making the network faster is not going to help if the flow completion times is dominated by the number of round trip times that congestion control mechanisms make the flow last. So it is the premise of my work that it is better to design congestion control for short download times or flow completion times by closely emulating processor sharing. And one of the practical ways of achieving that is uh, RCP. Okay, thank you. <laughs>